Hi everyone, I'm Chao Wei, I'm faculty associate with IIEP and also a faculty with the Department of Economics. So it's my honor to introduce two of our distinguished speakers for the next panel. Professor Su Ting is professor of economics at the Virginia Pony Pack Institute and the State University. She's a co-editor for the journal China Economic Review and, and has published widely on topics related to labor economics and the China economy. Professor Yang Huang Huang is professor of global economics and management at MIT. Professor Huang has published 11 books in Chinese and English and numerous and in numerous academic journals on issues, many of them relate to China. In addition to his academic publications, Professor Huang also engaged in uh, multidisciplinary program on food safety in China and in a program in Yunnan in training women entrepreneurs. So Professor Huang is widely respected as a leading scholar, um, leading American scholar on China economy. So you can read more about our speaker's files in the email attention. So now let's welcome Professor Su Ting to tell us about China's Sundown movement and what we can learn from it. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. So, and um, so I'm uh, at Virginia Tech. My name is Su Ting uh, So I'm actually a labor economist. But this is a joint project with a few like behavior experimental economists. So you see the sort of the behavior flavor when we get you to the paper. So my colleague uh, at Virginia Tech, Cheryl Ball and Alex Smith, and then a former student of us, uh, Xiaomin Zhang. Uh, he's now at uh, Nanjing Audit University. And then um, um, uh, Wei Wang from, um, yeah, also in China. So very quickly, Kind of as a motivation, immediate economic preferences we know is very important, plays a fundamental role in our decision making. And standard economic model tend to assume that these preferences are stable. So example, we say, well, you assume a model, then you assume preferences are stable, we can run counterfactual. But of course, our understanding has been evolving. So we understand that from the literature, from psychology and behavior economics that you know this preferences actually you know, can be changed, especially during you no know, use time, like you know, when you're young, and this you know, depends on cultural, political, macroeconomic environment. And then sort of again this background, so we use China Sandown movement as an actual experiment, you know, try to identify the causal impact of these life experiences. And kind of unique feature of this life experiences with Sandown movement is it's a policy induced life experiences, how that affect economic practices. So a little bit more background. So since we're talking about China, so, you know, so that we have to put a picture of, no, but uh, joking aside, so the, the center movement in Chinese is called Shang Shan Xia Xiang. So literally means up to the mountains and down to the countryside movement. Okay. And so during this period of time, so young students, you know, including Xi Jinping, so he was um, at age 16 in 1969. He was part of this cohort that sent down to, you know, to the countryside so in particular. So he went to this village called Liangjiahe in Shanxi province. And now this kind of a shrine for the you know, Chinese you know, officials to visit. So you know he he sort of you know referred to his experience oftentimes you know when after he you know get, get into power so you see a picture then and then now so but you know, the other picture you can see is like these you know young students you know, you know work with you know, local farmers into like this very you know harsh environment and do manual labor so let me take you, tell you, you know, a little bit about this um, uh, the stand down movement. So this is a call for now. So it is very necessary for the educated youth to go to the countryside to be re-educated. So the key was the re-educated by the poor farmers. Okay? So he made this statement in December 1968. So Sandamum actually started before 1968. But after he made a statement, so the Sandam movement becomes a kind of you no know, official mandate, kind of a state policy. 
So what happened is, you know, during this time, the so university were completely closed. You know, between 1966 to 1971, so they partially reopened in 1972, mm -hmm. but it didn't, you know, really like you know, open until uh, officially opened in 1977. And during this time, so the kids cannot go to school, cannot go to college, and then every urban family was forced to send at least one child to the countryside. Okay? And in total, approximately you know, 70 million urban youth you know, born between 1946 and 1961 were sent down to the countryside during this movement. And then the sent down youth you know, spent up to 10, 10 years. Like for example, Xi Jinping spent like seven years in Liangjiang you know, for his you know, part of the, the participation in the movement. Okay. So these, these young students, they live with the farmer, they perform like, you know, uh, manual labor. And so this, this sort of, you know, why we study this, because this sort of, you know, give us a you know, unique opportunity, you know, for economists, you know, we, we are interested in these causal inferences. So you know, how the life experiences you know, affect your, you know, uh, you know Causally affect your, you know, economic preferences. Mm -hmm. So that gives us, you know, an unique you know, opportunity because, you know, you could always, you know, think about, well, what if there's some non-random selection of individual go to, you know, go to the countryside? Maybe they're doing like a voluntarily, and then their economic preferences might be different from those who choose not to go. Okay? But because it's a state mandate, so that gives us, you know, this opportunity, you know, to to for that identification. Okay? So in particular, we explored the discontinuity in the probability of being sent down when the program was you know, suddenly terminated. Okay. So in 1977, so the program after the Cultural Revolution was ended, so the, the program was just you know, immediately you know, terminated. So it's like you know, China Bureau uh, COVID policy, overnight then it stops, it stops. Okay. So we just explored that discontinuity. So I will tell a little bit more details in a little. Then we compare the economic preferences for those, you know, just above the age cutoff and then just below the age cutoff. So the older guys were subject to be sent down and the younger guys, younger cohorts were not subject to send down. Then we see that discontinuity. We use that variation to identify the impact on economic preferences. Okay. And then we control a bunch of other you know, characteristics. And then the main finding is that you know, indeed this experience matters. Okay. So individuals that were sent down, so they are more risk averse, they are more artistic, and then they're more likely to return others' panics. Okay. So this is sort of you know, what the government program goal was. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, they're also less likely to trust the government or support income redistribution policy. Then we also find some heterogeneity, you know, like say between men and women. I'm just gonna skip that. So there's some evidence, but we are really using this kind of unique opportunity to identify the causal unit. So I know there are a lot of experts on cultural revolution, and that's true. So, but you now for those who are not expert in the, you know, and, and this part of the Chinese you know, uh, history, so let me tell you a little bit more about the historic background. Okay? So uh, Mao launches the 10 year long so-called the great uh, proletarian and the cultural revolution in May, 1966. So the background is really there's like this power struggle within the CCP. So the you know many of the pragmatic you know, leaders within the party, so they think you know, their thinking was you know, the re revolution is over, so the party should be a governing party. Whereas you know, Mao, for Mao, he's thinking is you know, we need to continue this revolution. So the Communist Party should still be a revolutionary party. So this like you know, ideology sort of you know, disagreement so also lead to like a power struggle. So after the failure of the Great Leap Forward, so Mao was sort of, you know, you know, retreated a bit and then behind the scene, you know, in a kind of power center, but then he was not happy about that. And then he initiated this, you know, cultural revolution. And then the campaign largely, you know, relied uh, upon the mobilizing of mass support. So we talked about earlier, like you know, how the Mao's ideologies, like, you know, this mass, you know, uh, mobilization. And the, particularly among the, the, the young people, the youth, the so-called red guards. Okay. So he mobilized red guards and kind of, you know, you know they removed the party officials and then they do these struggle meetings, you know, against the intellectuals and then the, the party elites. And then this red guards campaign became increasingly violent in 1967. Okay. 
So it becomes like, you know, all these factions, you know, conflicts, even like faction wars. So they have access to the military, then they're like, you know, fighting, you know, you know across, you know, China, you know, in many cities. So things like started getting out of control. Okay, so, and then, so that's when this, you know, this, this call came in on December 1968. So Chairman Mao called for a mass and you know, resignation movement to send the urban youth to the countryside and also made this, you know, send down move to manage, a state mandate. Even though, if you look at the data, so there were also youth you know, who got sent down in the early 1960s. Some of them voluntarily, some of them do it like, you know, more suspended way, but at a local level, but they got like sort of, you know, you know, encouraged and like you know by the local officials. And on a personal note, actually, so I forgot to mention. So my father was you know, also among the stand up cohort. So he was uh, like a um, um, junior high school graduate, you know, in the in 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 the nineteen sixty eight, and he was sent down to the countryside. So I'm kind of a stand up baby. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what then you wonder like what did the government do that right? It's like a very extreme policy. Okay, so some you know some stated goals. So this is where the re-education comes from. So is to re-educate you know <laughs> urban youth. Okay? And remember this re-education is you know is ideological. You know it's it's about ideology. It's not about you know human capital because urban youth are on average much educated than the rural you know, farmers. It's really the ideologically, so they want to educate this, you know, the, the urban youth to learn from the farmers, you know, to, to create this more collective, you know, collectivism and a pro-social, pro-socialism values. But then the other goals, okay, so, you know, the other goal could be like, you know, to dis, you know, discharge the Red Guards and to restore the social orders in the city because there's all the city violence. And then it could also be you know, trying to reduce the urban unemployment because there's like very high urban unemployment at that time in the late 1960s. And then another you know, um, goal is to you know, promote rural development because you know, by sending the more educated, you know, educated meaning like you know, in terms of human capital schooling to bring more educated people to the more backward you know, rural side, you know, rural area. So then who was sent down? So these are the urban you know, junior and senior uh, high school graduates. So typically between 16 to 19. So the college was closed, so they have no, nowhere to go. They will you know, send down to work uh, with the farmers. Okay. And then you now some of the urban youth, they were inspired by government propaganda. So they were actually went to the countryside voluntarily, but most of the youth you know, did not want to go. Okay. And, but every family, was supposed to send at least one child to rural areas. Okay? So even party elites, you know, they could not prevent their children from you know, being sent down. For example, you know, Xi Jinping, his family obviously is like higher echelon of the, the party you know, governance, but you know, he was also you know, sent down and many of his siblings as well. And the movement was you know, sort of you know, terminate in 1977 after the death of Mao, after the end of the Cultural Revolution. Again, it's like overnight you know, thing. And those who are affected is the, those you know, who were born in 1946 and 1961. So what is the stand down experience like? Okay. So sometimes like, you know, you hear like the rhetoric you know, from some people, like, you know, Xi Jinping actually talked about his experience quite often. You know, it's almost like a romanticized. I said, oh, you know, we're doing this work, we're making friends with the farmers. But in, you know, in reality, so you know, this experience actually was quite traumatic. Okay? So if you just look at, you know, she's own experience. So according to some accounts, so he was, you know, there for a few months. Actually, he, you know, he went back to, to Beijing because it's too difficult for him. You know, for like back in the 1960s, so the living standard between urban and rural China was huge. So they have to leave their urban home. They go to like you know working with the with the farmers, living in this cave house. You know, he actually you know deserted. He went back to to Beijing and then spent a few months. Then he was arrested and sent back. Then later on he climbed the party ladder and so on. So there's some accounts about you know he went to his mom and so on. But you know, I should go into detail about that. But anyhow. So because they were away from their urban home, from their family, 
and they live much worse in conditions, like you know, in the rural side, in the rural area, usually with no electricity, no running water, you know, no basic you know, sanitation, no health care. And then they were you know, required to do this in a very strenuous you know, physical you know, labor. Then remember again, they're 16 to 19 year old, but you know, just teenagers, really. So for long hours, so usually they have like 10, you know, 10 plus hours per day, you know, seven days a week, and under very bad you know, working conditions. And then they can also rarely visit their families. So their day-to-day -day, you know, social interactions really was with, with the local farmers and maybe some of the kind of urban youth like themselves, you know, will, you know, will send them. So how do we measure? So the kind of the, the big challenges, like, you know, as we talked about in, with China is like, you know, where the data come from, right? So we actually design and collect the data on, on, our, on, our, on our own. Okay, so we have a team um, at Virginia Tech. So, um, we have a lab, so we, we design a new survey on Chinese preferences based on the, you know, the well-known global preference survey. And we collect data on you know, individuals' risk, risk preference, you know, time preference, altruism, reciprocity, you know, trust, you know, trust of others, trust of government, trust for media, and then their redistribution preferences and economic rationality. So we collect a bunch of, you know, a battery of you know, uh, variable information and then we also collect detailed information on their demographics and also their socioeconomic you know, characteristics, like their, you know, their, their family background, as well as individual you know, birth state, okay, which is you know, important for our identification. And then, um, so where we collect this data is through a China's you know, largest online survey platform called Sojang. And so they have like a kind of about like a, you know, two, three million you know, you, you know, uh, regular users. So then we sample, um, you know, ask them to you know, get, give us a sample, then we send out the surveys. And then in the end, we got like about 1800 observations, you know, uh, uh, responses. And then between, they were born between 1935 and 1985. So this is our sample coverage. So it has like pretty good representativeness of you know, Chinese uh, population. And then just in terms of empirical you know, identification strategy, so left hand side there, but YI is just all these measures for economic preferences. And then our main right hand side variable is the send down status, so whether this person has been sent down during the movement. So the challenge of you know sort of just estimating this you know, to try to figure out this relationship is that so there may be some non-random selection to treatment like me being sent down. For example, one could argue that you know, you know even though the movement was you know, compulsory, but some people you know with the privileged you know families they might have avoided or they may have been sent to like you know better places and a shorter time. And then some people who are more sympathetic to the program may you know volunteer. And then also remember families are required to send one kid, but then they're also you know, up to the family to decide which kid to send. So there may be some selection there. So therefore, what we do is you know, we you know, really look at the you know, user variation you know, through this you know, sudden termination of the, of, the, of, the, of the program. So the birth cohort directly affected by the Zenda movement were determined by really the timing of the policy and also school going age. Remember, the kids are those you no know, use. I shouldn't say kids. So the youths are like you know they're you know junior or senior high school graduates. Okay, so the last cohort who got you know, affected by the policy is really the graduates from the you know, junior high school in 1977. So these are the kids who were born in 1961. So we use that as a cutoff you know, to identify um, the impact. Okay. So we use that age cutoff. So if we look at, you know, these are the, the estimate number of send down use, you know, between 1962 to 1980. So we use uh, really this, this sudden drop, this variation. So you may wonder why, you know, another possibility is to use a kind of the starting point. Okay. The reason we didn't use that is because we saw it's not as clean, because, you know, some of the use, they actually, you know, already went, you know, down to countryside before the state mandate. So with that variation, so we implement a so-called fuzzy RD design. So we use that, you know, the age difference as an instrument for the send down status. So that's our first stage. 
And then we use the, the predicted standard status you know, to look at how that affects the outcome. So all the economic preferences variable in the uh, YI. And then the instrument is being reborn you know, before that age cutoff. So you're still eligible for the, uh, for the census. So to make the, the RD design you know, valid, so you cannot manipulate this, you know, this cutoff. Okay. So one concern is what if the parents you know, man manipulate the timing of their, their children's birth? Okay. You know, like a few you know, arguments you know, make us you know, reasonably comfortable that's not possible. So first, it's, it's, it's reasonable to believe that people will not have been able to anticipate the start and end of the, the, the cultural revolution and the send up movement. Okay, because this is just kind of you know, all very sudden, even I, I believe for the, the, the upper officials. And then deliberately time the birth of the child. So it's quite um, you know, you know, unlikely. And then also you would have, even if you want to, it would have been difficult to manipulate the exact timing of your childbirth because at that time the ultrasound you know, the, you know, and the cesarean section were not widely available in China. And, but nevertheless, we did like some of the statistical tests to see if there's density change around the cutoff, and we don't see. <laughs> and then, so, and then to have this, you know, RD design sort of, you know, um, uh, valid, so we also need to make sure that other variables do not jump around the cutoff. So all these, you know, the vertical line are the age cutoff I was referring to. So we see that all these individual characteristics actually also change like very, you know, quite smoothly around the, the cutoff. So there are a few other potential, you know, confounding changes. So the idea that what if there's some other changes right, you know, around the cutoff. So there's some arguments. I'm going to kind of skip that. If there's some interest, I can come back to these points. I'm going to just show you the results. So this is the first stage. So it shows you like around that cutoff. So the zero will be the exactly the age cutoff, okay? So, and then to the left are the older cohorts who are subject to the stand down movement. And then to the right are the cohorts a little bit you know, younger, so they're not subject to the stand down movement because of termination. So we see kind of a big, you know, discontinuous you know, change. So that's a variation we explore, okay? And then this is a little messy because we have a lot of you know, uh, uh, outcome variables. So. But we do see, like, say, for example, the positive reciprocity, there's a discrete you know, um, change. Then the trust government, there's a discrete change. And then also the redistribution um, preferences, there's a discrete change. So this is sort of a non parametric way to present the results. Okay. So here's our main results. Um, so we see that, so we look at like different you know, specifications. So this font size is a little small, but you know, the, um, what we're really looking at are these, like, you know, we have 12 measures of economic preferences. We look at the same down effect on the, these economic preferences. These are the, our second stage, you know, estimates. So we see that the same down experience really make people more risk averse, you know, have more like, positive reciprocity and more altruistic, but less likely to trust the government or support the redistribution policy. And then we have a bunch of robustness check. I'm just, just gonna skip. So you now we have like different measure for like a standard experience instead of just zero one, we look at the duration. And then we also look at like some potential influence of city violence during the cultural revolution, potential confounding effect of great famine, and then also you know, some uh, effects of education and income. So I'm gonna skip that. So just the one last thing I wanna show you into the results is like, Sorry, this is a little small. So like this, you know, we look at whether between men or women and versus, you know, people from more privileged families, meaning those, you know, kids from the like, military official families versus non-privileged families, if there's any differences. We do see that, you know, it tends to be like, you know, for females, those effects are larger. And then maybe there's like a little bit evidence like for the non-privileged families, they are more affected. Okay. Um, I'll just summarize very quickly. So you now we use the China Standard Movement as an actual experiment you know, to study the impact of this law. So the, this policy is very unique because it's about re-education. It's designed to change people's preferences. And we see that you know, it, it did, and these experience matters. And then you know, we show that the standard experience significantly changes you know, the preferences. They make people more risk averse. 
and are altruistic and more likely to engage in positive reciprocity. This may be in line with the kind of the policy goal of the government, but there's also, in a sense, unintended consequences in the sense that they also make people less likely to less likely to trust the government and also support the redistribution policy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, my um, um, my presentation is um, also about history, but probably goes longer than the uh, cultural mission. And, and one of the findings is interesting if uh, altruism and risk aversion were shaped by the uh, Sengang movement. Uh, it's fair to say Xi Jinping is probably an outlier. Um, <laughs> It didn't have a huge effect on the statistical results. Um, <laughs> uh, anyway, so the uh, so I actually go back to uh, sixth century and all the way, and it is based on my forthcoming book, um, the rise and the fall of the East. But East here is not a geography; it is uh, exam. Uh, autocracy, stability, and technology. So this book um, uh, addresses these four topics. And, and the main uh, idea of the book is that the first letter uh, exam, the civil service exam um, established in China in 598, or um, there's some dispute about exactly when it was established, or in 605, shaped the nature of the Chinese political development, technological development, um, and, and uh, directly and indirectly economic development. Um, so um, since this is a general audience, I'm not going to go into great details about some of the data we use. Uh, Liu Hua uh, constructed a data set on social uh, interactions among Chinese elites. Uh, we spent six years um, uh, 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 constructing a database on Chinese uh, technology and we, uh, Chinese inventions in history of from um, uh, 5th century BCE all the way to the beginning of 20th century. And now we have um, over 10,000 uh, observations of Chinese inventions. And we, uh, a group of us, including three academics in China, one um, academic at Stanford and myself, we are writing a book on the history of Chinese technology. It is under contract um, from um, Princeton University Press. So the technology piece here takes um, takes a uh, takes um, some findings from that ongoing book project. But my talk is um, not about technology, um, but about other things. And um, let me let me emphasize this part of the presentation, which is uh, the um, civil service examination system in Chinese. It's called Kuju, established in the sixth century. Still has substantial uh, effects on the political bureaucratic practices uh, and intellectual cognitive practices in China today. And in terms of, if you look at the CCP system, uh, the meritocratic and meritocracy uh, sometimes is understood in a positive way, which is that you promote people by merit. In my book, I actually don't take that definition of meritocracy. Um, because during the Great Leap Forward, uh, that was also meritocracy. You get promoted by starving peasants to death. Um, so it's really, or sending intellectuals to the countryside as righteous. In my book, I talk about meritocracy as a, a system of evaluation and using metrics to promote or demote people. So I don't really talk about the KPI, which is the key performance indicator. That KPI can be ideological struggles and political struggles, or it can be um, a GDP promotion. 
And the way that I interpret Xi Jinping is uh, he sort of shifted the KPI. He still has meritocracy, but he shifted the KPI from uh, economics to politics. And, and that has all sorts of consequences on, uh, on, on Chinese economy, Chinese uh, technology development, and also on Chinese uh, relationship with the rest of the world. And it has the exam, the most direct effect of the exam is that it has a huge impact on Chinese capability. And also on uh, attitudes, attitudinal um, uh, attributes. So one of the claims that I made in the book is that the exam in, uh, incubated and entrenched this sort of authority deference um, and lack of skepticism and uh, sort of absence of abstract thinking. And all these things were actually detrimental to science and to technology. Um, but they were also detrimental to the development of alternative ideas and alternative uh, ideologies, and I use that to explain the failure of kind of uh, emergence of, um, say, uh, secularism, liberalism, and science in China. And I believe that those uh, attitudinal attributes are still widely um, shared by the Chinese population um, today, and, and that is a stabilizing uh, element in the Chinese society. And I believe that the economic development, the global engagement, globalization, they have not gone far enough to undermine those uh, attitudinal pillars of the Chinese uh, autocracy. If we gave globalization and economic development, say another five years and 10 years, they, they might have a, a, a chance to um, and attenuate some of these ideas and, and sort of habitual way of thinking, um, but, but they don't have uh, the, um, the chance to do that. And I actually believe that uh, Xi Jinping knows this, uh, and that's why he took actions to, um, to slow down and even stop globalization. The whole critique of uh, engagement has not been effective in changing Chinese political system. I, I think there's a large element of truth to that uh, assertion, but it is also interesting that the Chinese autocrats disagree with that. Uh, they crack down on private sector, they curtail foreign um, interactions, including um, data sharing and, and all of that, precisely because they are actually uh, believers in uh, engagement uh, strategy, and they just simply don't want to end up on the receiving side of that uh, fact. Um, so, could you let me just say quickly uh, a few things about could you? Um, it is a remarkable uh, institution. Um, it was established in the sixth century, um, and then it took uh, the institution another 700 years to become systematic, to become uh, standardized. The systematization of a cookie is by the standard of pre-modern era, incredibly advanced. It has three tiers of provincial, metropolitan, and palace. It was held regularly over um, centuries, every three years, and the uh, candidates uh, went through a nationwide preparatory uh, system of preparation. It was anonymized. So Chinese actually invented the double blind system. The examiner doesn't know who the examinee is. The examinee doesn't know who the examiner uh, is. Uh, it is just, a Chinese also invented the standardized test. Um, the curriculum was uh, standardized. Um, it was in continu nearly in continuous operation 
from 6th century to the beginning of the 20th century. It was a, a, a abolished in 1905. And just think about a system that is roughly in place for uh, 1,500 years, uh, drawing a large segment of the population. It was only uh, open to the male uh, population. So, but, but there's a spillover to the female segment of the population because the young boys were educated by their mother, mothers. And so, so this is a massive uh, system and drawing uh, very deep and wide from the Chinese society. So broad and diverse socioeconomic socio uh, scope, um, substantial upward and downward mobility because of the country. Uh, very systematic, as I pointed out. Um, and so in our paper, uh, it was really just, I was just shocked by the finding that um, there was no statistical uh, uh, significant effects of family backgrounds on your exam performance. Right? Just think about even today that uh, people who uh, do well on the exams, uh, not, not largely, but, but in part because of the family backgrounds. But in, the, in, in our paper, we didn't find any uh, of that kind of effect. Um, but, but the key thing is that because it was perceived as objective and legitimate, it was able to draw in uh, such a large segment of the male population. So the basic claim is that the exam affected the entire society in terms of their uh, mental and ideological um, um, views. So in terms of the effect, uh, I argued um, that Kezhi uh, consolidated autocracy in China, made autocracy very strong. And Yu Hua showed uh, data on the decline of uh, political instability in the sense that the rulers were overthrown by, by the generals, by the senior officials. Uh, we, we find exactly the same thing. Closely clustered in terms of timing, after the introduction of Kuzhi uh, system. Capabilities, uh, there's evidence to show that Chinese literacy was quite high. Um, and what's also remarkable is that the Chinese numerous, the ability to read numbers uh, was on a par with most advanced European countries in 17th century, 18th century, and 19th century. 19th century took a dip. 17th century, 18th century, and that was in the uh, Oxford University's uh, database, uh, our, world, uh, our World in Data. Cognitions, um, what could you did was um, demolish kind of the horizontal flows of ideas because it was vertical, right? So you took an exam and you were tested only on what uh, the Confucianism, uh, Confucianist ideology uh, text. So it was a vertical, purely vertical rather than horizontal. And then it preempted uh, curiosity, skepticism, and abstraction. So in our technology, beta, technology data set, we showed that uh, Chinese technology began to decline very close in timing with the introduction of Kuzhi. Um, in fact, that finding is quite uh, remarkable because if it is true, I'm not saying it is. Uh, it is. Uh, it is um, true because historical data are sometimes uh, fuzzy. Um, but most historians believe that Chinese technology only began to decline in 17th century, whereas our data show that Chinese technology began to decline as early as the 6th century, as soon as Kuzhi was introduced. Um, let, let, let me talk about the effects today. Um, one effect shows up in human capital. Uh, and and uh, so, as I said before, high rates of participation, uh, 30 to 40% of the male population was literate, um, high rates of Chinese numeracy. So this going back, right, 1500 years of human capital development and incubation, 
And what we know from uh, economic research is that uh, human capital effects are sticky, are persistent, and they are replicated over generations. Um, so if there's one effect coming from Turkey, that effect is likely still to be alive uh, today. This is the way that I uh, explain the East Asian takeoff. Right? So if you think about uh, Korea, Japan, uh, uh, Taiwan, they are essentially Kyrgyz legacy economies, and to some extent Vietnam today. Um, in combination with reasonable economic policies, then these human capital effects began to use a economic effect. And that happened in the rest of East Asia, outside of China, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, after World War II. Because China had really bad economic policies, so no matter what your human capital um, was, it, it couldn't achieve the same effect, except after 1970, right, when you have reasonable economic policies. Um, So let me talk about the uh, the cognitive effects. So one of the claims that I made in my book is that um, we shouldn't think about autocracy in China today as purely based on violence and coercion. Um, it is based on a large degree of societal acceptance. It is not, I actually don't buy the view that uh, Chinese Communist Party derives uh, legitimacy from performance. If you look at Great Leap Forward, that was a gigantic failure, but somehow that didn't affect that uh, legitimacy. Um, so it is, it is what I call uh, asiomatic. So it is not really based on performance. If you perform, you get a, like a, almost like a professor is giving a student uh, like a plus, right, A plus, you get a bonus. Uh, but if you don't perform, I still accept it. Uh, so that, that's the way that I uh, interpret the prevailing uh, kind of uh, view on the part of the masses toward uh, uh, the regime. It's just, you are legitimate. I, I'm not going to ask any questions. I, I, I don't even think about asking uh, further questions. And that gave the regime a lot of stay in power. Right? Um, and because you're not being questioned. Um, so there's also absence of collective actions in civil society. So think about Kyrgyz, right? It is, um, uh, you're locked up in a little room, you uh, take the exam, you cannot uh, collaborate with, with others. Uh, if you do, you'll be punished. So it is the, and, and I use that to explain why in China today you observe uh, incredible amount of individualism, right? entrepreneurship and, and comp economic competition, market competition. But you don't observe um, organized competition, organized uh, entrepreneurship um, because there's no collective action. And my view of democracy is that Democracy, you know, we emphasize individual values. Actually, democracy is based on collective actions. It, it is based on church. It is based on uh, bowling, <laughs> bowling uh, together, right? It is based on the central groups and New England town meetings. Uh, it is actually not only because of individual actions, whereas China excels at individualism, but it is very bad at and when you have high level of individualism without collective action, the regime is incredibly strong because at any given time, the regime only faces one or two uh, individuals rather than society as a whole. And, and I use that reasoning to explain why after the COVID protest, the regime uh, still uh, remained uh, stable. Unless you have divisions among the elites, policy elites. In fact, if you uh, sort of survey the political science literature on um, autocratic stability um, and instability, that research shows that the instability in autocracies 
is truly a result of elite instability rather than the instabilities in the society uh, among the masses. And we don't see that. And Xi Jinping has demolished almost all of it. Um, so let me just end by drawing some policy implications on this way of looking at China. I, uh, because I believe that the autocracy, not, not the substantive claims of autocracy, but this habit of thinking about autocracy, don't question it, deference to it, is so ingrained in the society. I think it's a wrong idea to take on an ideological, an ideological sort of direct ideological um, <laughs> debate with, with the Chinese. We should, we should sort of stay away from that. Um, I mean, language on regime change, class of civilizations, ideological uh, clashes. I just think that kind of language is incredibly unhelpful. Un un we should take and even sometimes take a firm stand on incentive issues, like concrete economic and, and maybe social and political uh, concrete issues. Uh, you know, I, I name economic things, but, but later on I'm going to talk about human rights, tariffs, and market access. New York Times and China Daily, I, I'm always puzzled why the US government never took on the Chinese government. Um, Google and New York Times. You know, I don't know about uh, GW, but at the MIT, we can pick up a China Daily on, on the floor, uh, usually free of charge, <laughs> where you can access New York Times in, in China. Why not establish uh, symmetrical uh, treatment, right? So this is no more, no less than what, um, what the Chinese uh, access is to the American market. We're not asking more, we're not asking less, just, just allow New York Times and, and Google. Um, I, I applaud by the administration on uh, PCAOB. Uh, I just think that it was deplorable that previous administrations never took on with the Chinese on, on that issue. Um, I, I, another idea is that the kind of language that we use really, really matters. Um, and human rights, for example, uh, I think it's perfectly legitimate to discuss human rights between U.S. and China. Chinese are actually doing that. Um, and uh, at the Alaska meeting, um, when Yang Jiechi launched this long critique of U.S. Uh, human rights record, uh, after he finished his long speech, I was just shocked that Blinken and uh, Sullivan sort of didn't say much, and they said, oh, you know, this is about international order. This is about uh, rule of law. What he, they didn't recognize is that by criticizing U.S. and human rights, Chinese are essentially acknowledging that human rights is a legitimate <laughs> conversation topic between U.S. and China. They didn't seize on that. And they let the, so they had a perfect opportunity to force the Chinese either to say it is not a legitimate topic, then contradict themselves, right? Or accept it as a legitimate topic. And then they can go on and say, okay, why don't we have more dialogue? And, 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 then, and then we have to be very, very honest. You know, this country and much of the West has, has had a horrible uh, struggles in human rights. And, but precisely by allowing press freedom, and other freedoms, and we improve over time, right? So that ought to be the way to have that dialogue with the Chinese, and they never did. Um, and by the way, I really agree with Bush. I think the Chinese, uh, the U.S. government expertise on China is uh, um, is not there. Um, and we should quote Deng Xiaoping, right? Deng Xiaoping famously said, "Look at the friends of uh, Soviet Union." Their economies are, are all uh, in the toilet. He, he didn't quite say that, but <laughs> whatever, right? Look at the friends of the US, their economies are prosper. Why not quote that, right? Back to the Chinese. The single incredible fact is that China is the biggest beneficiary of the current global international economic order. 
the biggest in history, probably bigger than the US itself. Um, and so I would argue that we should emphasize the benefits of the current international order on um, the Chinese themselves, right? rather than what Blinken and uh, Sullivan said. Uh, what they said is, oh, you are disturbing, you are challenging the, the current international order. The Chinese look, look at that statement and they say, well, you have your order, we have ours. Right? Uh, our economy now is second largest in the world, and we have a legitimate right to create our order. Yeah, you create your order, you go back to the you. And so, so that ought to be the way to have that conversation. Okay, my time is out. Uh, let me just go back and say thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, I'm able to ask you one question for you. So for Su Qin, I really interested in, you know, when you talk about there the difference between male and females in terms of the impact of some government. So could you say a little bit? that in terms of family background, yeah. what impact, and also I was interested in the location of the Sundown. Yeah. Um, so how the, the, the destination of the Sundown movement for different people, different individuals affect their preferences? Yeah, great question. So this is, uh, um, so in terms of the gender differences, so um, our view is that like this whole experience is particularly traumatic for a woman. You know, imagine like a 16 year old you know, girl you know, being sent down to a countryside with no family and they have to do all these like a manual you know, job, very harsh manual job. So that's like particularly traumatic experience. And then there are also accounts, even though we don't have very good statistics, there are also accounts that see like, you know, like literature, novels, and you no know, movies, you no know, girls you know, being sent down, there were manipulated, like, you know, abused, you know, in different ways, um, both physically and mentally, and then in other ways. So, so we believe that this, you know, particular harsh experience for them so led to, like, you know, stronger impact in terms of, like, say that, you know, we, we see the most significant difference in trust of the government. We see most significant in, you know, risk of risk aversion. And then in terms of the other question about the destination of the center, so unfortunately, we don't have very good information on that. We only have information on you know, whether they got sent down, how long they stayed, but we don't have specific information. We have some information, but then the, since we don't have a huge you know, sample size, we cannot really sort of you know, look at this, you know, impact of the destination. Okay, great. So I have a question for Professor Huang. So there are people who are I think there are two places that were really surprised. And the first is that you mentioned that the family wealth yeah. actually did not have significant impact on the success of um, the cookie system. And uh, the second place I was surprised is that when you say that actually you find that technology decline actually started with the introduction of cookie system. So I have two questions. The first, we regard to the, you know, lack of impact of family wealth. Are the, fun, uh, are the findings robust throughout all the dynasties, or it's only when the dynasties are in their prime time? <laughs> so we regard to the second place where I, I was surprised is how how did you measure the technology? Fine. Just a little bit more about that. Sure. So, so let me uh, answer the second question first. The way that we, uh, so, so this database, uh, as I said, has now 10,000 observations. We essentially uh, digitize the, don't say, Needham's 27 volumes on science and civilization of China, complemented, uh, supplemented by a volume uh, published by Chinese Academy of Sciences on um, uh, history of Chinese technology. So whatever uh, they define as an invention, we define as invention in our database. We don't really create independent uh, uh, definition. In terms of the specific measures, it is, um, so, so let me just say that the previous 
largest data set on um, Chinese historical te technology has about 600 observations. We have 10,000. So there's just, there's actually not a single database on European invention at all. Right? Um, so, so this is quite, quite uh, unique. Um, in terms of the specific measures, it is uh, a per capita measure. We also compiled the best estimates of Chinese populations over time. So essentially, it is everything divided by uh, by population, which is really the right measure rather than just looking at inventions themselves, because population sizes also differ across different dynasties. In terms of your um, uh, your other question about the family wealth. Um, so these are uh, data from the Ming dynasty, just one dynasty alone. Uh, there were about 400 grams of these hands, and the data is at the individual level, uh, so the candidate level. We know something about their fathers, we know something about the status of their fathers, and also in the um, in a kind of this weird record keeping of, of Chinese uh, imperial system. They also uh, write down uh, how many wives you have. <laughs> and that allowed us to construct a measure on family wealth. Because that was in the United States, they didn't ask you, you know, the value of your house and what is the expense of it. So we can only kind of do it that way. And so there's a long historical research that shows that. Family health is uh, correlated with the uh, number of spouses that you have. So, using that measure, uh, we couldn't find any evidence on, on the, uh, the effect of uh, proxy measure of the family wealth on um, your placement of the plan performance during the anonymized stages of that. During the unanonymized stage, they actually had the effect. So anonymization actually works. That's, that's the idea. That's fascinating. So now I'm. I hope so. <laughs> now I'm going to open up more for questions. Um, we are getting between you guys and the lunch. So I'm going to take the questions just there and then one. So um, I have a question for both of you since you started that. First, I had heard about the people who were sent down and they came back. They were the ones because they, they 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 faced unemployment, and they were the ones who started all these businesses. They were the ones who started selling things in the streets, and they were the first generation of you know startup entrepreneurs. So it kind of goes against what you were saying about there being risk averse. Uh, so I just wonder how you came to the conclusion they were risk averse, and how that jars with the notion that these people actually had to start businesses, otherwise they would starve. So I also have a, a question for Professor uh, Huang concerning the uh, impact of his examination to control uh, this or diffuse the uh, elite conflicts that it seems to go in the opposite logic of the presentation we had prior to your presentation, which didn't mention the examination system and how the examination system was really what would control the dynamics of, it, of, of the elite action with the state. Yeah, thank you for the question. So in terms of like this risk preferences, so um, the way we measure it is, so we ask them in the survey, so you know, how do you think you are likely to take risk? So that's part of the question. And then we also ask them to like make some choices, like say, if you have a like a half chance to get like three hundred million versus like you know zero like a half chance to get nothing versus like you have like hundred percent sure you get one hundred sixty million, which option you will choose? So you we have like a set of questions for all these people, you know, all those who got sent down and people who got no not got sent down. So then the kind of difference. So that's how we measure risk purposes. And then in terms of like I think you. You know, your, your narrative about, well, in the 80s, a lot of these sent down youth, so they come back, they don't have jobs, and then, you know, they started this business, it seems like more entrepreneurship. Um, so there is such narrative, but then there's also, you know, the, you know, we, we don't know what the control group do. 
I can also see they get sent down. So they also experience this whole you know, opening reform era. So they'll do similar things. So I'm I'm not you know, I don't I don't think I see any specific data on like there's a big difference. So like you know, when you're looking at the same cohort, you know, going through the same electromagnetic changes, transformation, and then they're making these different occupation and choice and you know, decision. Um yeah, I don't I don't think I saw any specific evidence. It might be true. But no. And then I think another thing I want to bring up is like for these stand down cohorts. So you see, like, you know, some of them didn't get the opportunity to go to, you know, go to university. I didn't show you the uh, the evidence we, we find of uh, the stand down experience on um, education and income. You didn't really see like the big difference. This was significant difference in terms of income, for example. Yeah. So, so the, the, um, uh, it, it is not contradictory, but it is a different explanation. The empirical pattern is actually very similar, which is that you see this decline of intra-elite instability roughly after and uh, after Tang Dynasty, beginning of the Qing Dynasty. This explanation is more um, prevalent among historians, and historians believe that. At the end of the Tang Dynasty, there was a very famous rebellion that basically killed off many of these aristocratic elites. And traditionally, it is the aristocratic elites that rebelled against the emperors and created the uh, instabilities. So, our explanation in my book is that uh, I believe that's true. But one thing we know about physical uh, killings is that they do not have long lasting effect. Okay. So the, 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 the fact is that aristocratic elites didn't come back uh, during the, the Yuan Dynasty or Ming Dynasty. And when they didn't come back, that was usually because of something that is institutional in the right? So you have a system. That prevented them from coming back. Going back to the kind of the entrepreneurship uh, question you asked, if you look at the, the first generation entrepreneurs in China, many of them came from families of uh, rich landlords and uh, uh, people like that. Right? So the communists killed off many of them. Um, but I guess there's a, I don't know, entrepreneurial gene that survived the killings and then they came back. Right? So, so but if you have, suppose China didn't reform, then they will not come back, right? Suppose that there were institutional restrictions on their ability to do business, then they will not come back. So I don't, I don't think the physical killing is the final explanation. It requires an additional explanation, which is that it has to be something longer lasting in the I remember there was one question and the last question. Well, I'm saying to my question. First of all, I have another question. The exam that you're talking about was ended in 1905, I think you said. Do you see any um, echoes of that through the Gao Pao, through the college entrance exam? Um, and then looking more recently, do you see challenges to the system from students who go out and get educated in the US or in Europe um, that has led to recent changes in the Gao Pao? Um, so I wonder if you could just speculate on, on these more modern exams and ways uh, around the effect the Gao Pao on college admissions have impact on Chinese society today. Yeah, so so, so definitely there is um, there's a legacy of impact on, on Gao Pao, but it's more than Gao Pao. There's a post civil service uh, exam. Um, there's also the entire system of grading your performance, whether it's GDP or something else. So in my book, I have sections on when you change from the GDP to politics to ideology. What that change essentially has done is that GDP uh, at least is partially based on objective facts, right? capital, labor, global economic conditions. If it is now shifted to ideology and politics, that's all kind of subjective and just questionable. 
and that does have a huge effect on the way that the Chinese system operates. In terms of GOKO, I think the challenge in the GOKO system uh, in the future, and, and actually it is happening now, is the US uh, China relationship. And, and I, they reacted to, to, that, to that by uh, reducing the globalization part of the uh, curriculum, right, like English um, and, and many other subject matters. Economics used to be um, more safe than other topics. It is no longer. It is just treated by politics and law, and it no longer has this separate um, treatment. And the other uh, big challenge to the GOKO system, and this is something that we all have to think about, is chat GPT. Right. right. So chat GPT is going to excel at GOKO uh, pretty easily. <laughs> and, and, and so, I mean, that's a common challenge that we all have to uh, actually. By the way, let me end by saying that. I think the bigger issue for all of us in the room, and you know, at least for the people working in the university settings, is in this day and age, how do we collaborate or not collaborate with Chinese research institutions? And by the way, I might be having a report uh, on that. Uh, it is, uh, I think I, it, it's the only um, uh, report by a university on that topic. I was one of the co authors. Uh, we have it's all online. We have 27 recommendations. Now we have an implementation committee implementing these uh, recommendations into our daily routines and, and protocols. Uh, it is a huge challenge. It is a huge challenge. I'm just reviewing a paper on how the uh, disruption to the scientific collaboration between the US and China has undermined the productivity of. I, I actually want to just uh, push that question a little bit further to ask you. So during the same moment, so I think there are two parts, right? The first part is that the students were no longer able to participate in the college entrance exam. The second part, they were sent down. So would you be able to distinguish <coughs> two effects? You know, there are there were some students who were not sent down, but they were not able to take college entrance exam. Yeah, so the, the, the school closure, so the time it was school closure, say 1966, so all schools in China essentially were closed down. So both the university and the primary, you know, junior, senior high schools. And then it was restored end of 1967. You no, know, for all other schools except for universities. And then for the university um, enrollment, it uh, sort of resumed partially in 1972. By that time, it's not merit based. It's all based on your kind of past background. So you have to be like, you know, from revolutionary family or, you know, from you know, parents and workers background family. So then some of the you know, selected groups then go to, go to colleges. But then they don't study like the usual like uh, you know, discipline that's like a math Chinese and then the you know science they study the you no know, like Mao Zedong thoughts and the, all these you no know, political you know, propaganda. So you know, for example, the current leader is like you know he went to college in 1975. So that's during that you know time. So people question about the, the quality of schooling. And then in in 1977, so this is when the marriage really, you know, resumed. So going back to your question, so our cohort, so what matters really is the cohort not around like, you know, like around 1961. So there were, um, so when the, then when the, the school were closed, so they were not at the school age yet, at the like, you know, college you know, age yet. So that's why we don't think you know, they were, you know, like, you know, they might be affected, but then they'll be affected in a similar way. So that will not affect our results. Okay, great. Thank you for the answer and please give a round of applause for the speaker.